Today we're extremely thrilled to have Ted Slingerland here. He's a, a professor, member of the faculty at the uh, University of British Columbia up in, up in Vancouver. And his specialty is a, a study of philosophy and Chinese thought. Um, he's a professor of East Asian studies and he also held a fellowship with the Centers for the Advanced Study at the Behavioral Sciences um, at Stanford. And this is in fact our third in an ongoing series of talks with, uh, with members and fellows from, from CASVIS. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ted to Google. Thank you. All right, thanks for having me. To get a sense of this, the topic of this talk, try not to try, the best, the best way to get a feel for this paradox that I'm going to be talking about is actually a, a game at my local science museum called Mind Ball. So the, the setup is pretty simple. You have two players at either end of a table. There's a little metal ball between them. And the goal is just to push the metal ball to the other side of the table. It gets there, buzzer goes off, and you win. So very simple setup. The, the twist is that you're not using your hands, you're using your mind. So I have my head against an EEG monitor there, and what that's picking up is alpha and theta waves. So alpha and theta waves are the activity your brain kicks off when it's in a rest state, when it's, not, when it's relaxed, when it's not trying. The way the game is constructed is the, the more alpha and theta waves you produce, the more force you exert on the ball. So the more you relax, the harder you push the ball. So the way to win at mind ball is to not try to win. You have to actually out relax your opponent. And it's incredibly difficult to do. Uh, the first time I played, I thought I do, I'm a professor of Chinese philosophy. I'll do some Zen thing. I'll be fine. Um, and I had my eyes closed. And I could, you could hear the, it makes a noise when the ball moves back and forth. It goes, ee, ee. And finally, I couldn't resist. I opened my eyes. And I was winning. The ball was almost at the other end of the table. And I thought, oh, I'm winning. And as soon as I thought that, the ball turned around and started rolling back toward me. And I started going, relax, relax, zen, zen. And it, it didn't work. So I got crushed by this, uh, the person I was playing against. It's, uh, it's challenging. So this, um, what I like about the game is that it compresses into the smallest possible space this paradox of how you can force yourself to not try. How can you f try to relax when you know that the key to succeeding is relaxation? How do you use your conscious mind to shut your conscious mind down? So it's really it's a great way of getting a sense of the paradox. Now this tension, this, this mind ball problem, is something that you see throughout life. And certain sub-communities in our culture are aware of this. So athletes know that they're at their best when they're in the zone. When they're relaxed, they're not thinking about what they're doing, they're just playing their game. And they worry a lot about falling out of the zone. Because once you fall out, it's, very, it's like the mind ball problem. It's very hard to get yourself back in again. Uh, performers, so people, musicians, actors, are also very aware of this. They know they're at their best when they're absorbed. They're not thinking too much about what they're doing. And, and they also worry very much about the choking, about falling out of the zone. So there's, there are certain sub-communities who are aware of this, this, the power of spontaneity and the problems involved in being spontaneous. But what we don't recognize, I think, as widely is that this is a tension we all experience. So we, even if we're not athletes or performers, we experience this tension on a regular basis. So a good example is insomnia. So you have an important meeting the next day. You know that you need to be well rested. You know that you're tired. Uh, if you could just shut your mind down, you know you would fall asleep. But how do you shut your mind down? How do you use your mind to shut your mind down? You think about social situations. So a uh, job interview or a first date. The best advice you can get is relax. People will t say that to you, right? Relax, be yourself. But how are you re going to relax if <laughs> faced by this, right? In a, in a situation that's objectively not relaxing, how do you force yourself to relax when you need to? This is, this is the mind ball problem or the paradox of trying not to try. So you see it uh, throughout uh, daily life. We, we run into it all the time. We don't tend to talk about it very much. So we don't have, uh, athletes have some words for it, like the zone. But we don't tend to talk about this very much, which is odd. And I think it's partly because our culture tends to focus a lot more on things like working and trying and striving. So our culture focuses on the opposite of spontaneity, on, on effort. So we send our preschoolers to Kumon schools so they can cram and get into the best elementary schools and get into the best high schools so they can pop Ritalin and get into the best colleges. And then they're going to be us, you know, constantly multitasking, constantly on 20 devices at once, never shutting down the flow of information 
And even the bedroom is no refuge anymore. Most people fall asleep tightly clutching their smartphones, right, sending off that last tweet. So we're constantly striving. We're constantly trying. We're never really, we get very little downtime, I think, in our, our daily lives. And technology is just making this worse. We used to have downtime built into our lives, and now we don't anymore. Now, this would all maybe be OK if it were the case that striving always worked. So if it were the case that all important goals in life were things that we could get, acquire through striving, maybe this is just our fate to be like Sisyphus, always pushing this, this stone up the mountain. Um, the problem with that is that that's not true. So there are a lot of very important goals in life that cannot be attained through direct striving. You can't pursue them directly. So for instance, charisma. If you're trying to be 007, you're not going to be 007. You've got to be like, you've got to pull it off that way, right? Um, creativity, artistic creativity, intellectual creativity is notoriously something that you can't force. It's got, it's got to come to you. It's got to come spontaneously. Uh, something like love of learning or love in general is not something you can force on a kid. They've got to, it's got to come from within. We have a sense that things like love have to spontaneously arise from within somebody. You can't try to do it. And if you try to do it, you're going to ruin it. Uh, same thing with things like fun uh, or happiness. If, if you pursue it directly, you crush it. Uh, we've all been at these parties where hosts have been saying, have fun, let's have fun. <laughs> Those are always the worst parties, right? Um, you, if you're trying to have fun, you're not going to have fun. So there are a lot of these goals that uh, just can't be obtained through striving. So striving is actually counterproductive in these cases. Um, why, why do we not realize this? And why do we not have, have language for the opposite of striving? We don't, we don't tend to have good words for these things. Um, I think it's partly the result of a philosophical hangover. So we are very much the heirs of enlightenment thought, people like Immanuel Kant, Rene Descartes, who have bequeathed to us what I'm going to call the disembodied myth. So this is this picture that what we are fundamentally is minds, disembodied minds. So we have bodies, but bodies are just there to kind of carry us around, um, make, get energy to our minds. But what we are is fundamentally minds. And so that means the way we obtain anything worthwhile in this myth is through rationality. So using amodal rationality to think, reason our way through dilemmas or to pursue goals. Self-control, so the mind needs to control the body. The body's got some potentially dangerous impulses that's, that have to be brought under control. And it's all about conscious effort. So anything worthwhile in this model is obtained through conscious effort in these three things. Now, the reason I call this the myth, disembodied myth, is it's pretty clear that this is not accurate from a cognitive scientific perspective. Um, so the so-called embodied cognition movement in cognitive science has been arguing for a long time, there's fairly good consensus, that we are, we're not brains in a vat, we're not disembodied minds, we're embodied. The way in which we think is inextricably tied up with our embodiment. So that means that we think in metaphors, we think in images. And these are not just terms of phrase. We actually really are thinking in imagistic terms. We think with our body. A lot of our knowledge is tacit. A lot of our most important knowledge is not something explicit or conscious. It's, it's something that we built into our body, our bodily knowledge, essentially. And this whole body-mind complex that we are was designed by evolution for doing things, for moving through the world in an effective way, not for thinking, not for abstract thinking. We're capable of abstract thinking, but it's not really what we're built for. So we are integrated mind-body systems. Now, given that, why, where did the disembodied myth come from? So why did it arise? Why is it appealing to people? It must have some appeal, because it's lasted for a long time. The source of the disembodied myth despite our embodied nature, is this experience we do have of being split. So we often experience a kind of tension within ourselves. We say things like, I had to drag myself out of bed this morning. Who's dragging whom, <laughs> right? There's only one person there. Who's in the bed? Who's doing the dragging? I had to hold my tongue. Who's, who are you if not your tongue? Who's, <laughs> who's holding what? It's just a very strange way to talk there. It seems like metaphors, but it's not metaphorical in the sense that it is, it's reflecting this tension we feel between parts of ourselves. And what I want to submit is what's, what we're feeling when we feel that tension is a tension between two basic cognitive systems we have. So we are integrated body-mind systems, but we have two basic modes of cognition. And, and social, uh, social psychologists, cognitive scientists, 
have different terms for this, hot versus cold, system one, system two, uh, bottom up, top down. Everybody has their own favorite terminology. But basically, they're, they're, they're integrated. They're designed to work together, but they are distinct. And they're neuroanatomically distinct. You can knock one out and preserve the other one. So they do seem to be different systems. The hot system, system one, is emotional. It's fast. It's frugal, it's automatic, and it's mostly unconscious. So we don't have typically conscious access to hot or system one cognition. System two or cold cognition is non-emotional, it's slower, it's under executive control, so it's what allows us to kind of stop something that's happening and do, choose another thing to do, and it's conscious. So this is the seat of our conscious awareness of ourselves and also of the conscious narrative we tell about ourselves that help us understand who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. So I think what we're feeling when we feel this kind of tension is, is essentially uh, the body-mind dualism, this idea that there's a tension between the two, falls out of the two-system nature of our minds. We tend to associate with system two. That's us. So when we, we have to drag ourselves out of bed in the morning, it's system two that knows we have an important meeting that's struggling with system one, the, the bodily systems that, that want to stay asleep, that are enjoying being asleep. Um, so this explains why, why this tension arises, why it seems intuitive to us. It also, I think, explains why trying not to try is a real paradox. When I'm sitting there, when I see that metal ball rolling back toward me and I say, stop thinking, relax, the part of my mind that I'm using is the part that needs to be shut down. The, the part of mind that you're accessing when you are consciously trying to relax or stop thinking, you're activating the very thing that you need to deactivate. So this, the two uh, system uh, model of the mind explains why the paradox is a real paradox. It is a, is a genuine uh, cognitive paradox. You need to get around it somehow indirectly. Now that said, it's a real paradox. We do need to get around it somehow. Because if we want to access the power of our hot systems, our embodied cognition, we need to figure out ways to get around this paradox of trying not to try. And this is where I find early Chinese philosophy, my basic specialty, very helpful. Because the what I sometimes call the mainstream thinkers in early China, the Taoists and Confucians, actually embraced an embodied model of the self. So they didn't see us as, as split fundamentally between body and mind in some really strong way. And they realized that you needed to cultivate bodily types of emotions and intuitions if you're going to produce uh, a, an excellent person, someone who's going to be successful in the world. Because they had this embodied model, they also had some concepts, some philosophical concepts that are not, I think, very well known in the West, but I think are, are helpful for us to learn about. So one of these is this idea of wu wei. Uh, or I like to translate, literally means no doing or no trying. I like to translate it as effortless action because you're often very active when you're in a state of wu-wei. It's a state where it's a lot like being in the zone as an athlete. You lose a sense of yourself as an agent. You lose a sense of effort. You don't feel like you're exerting effort, and yet everything works out perfectly. Everything, uh, you're successful. Everything's going the way you want it to go. Uh, one of the best illustrations of, of wu-wei is a story in this, this Taoist text, the Zhuangzi, about uh, Butcher Ding. So he's cutting up this ox in what's probably a very important public ceremony. So there's a huge crowd watching him. And it's, he's got to cut up this enormous animal. And he just kind of waves his cleaver, and the ox falls apart. And it's like he's dancing or performing classical music. And the ruler who's watching him do this says, how did you do that? That was amazing. And the butcher says, well, I don't, I don't have any skill. I don't know what I did. <laughs> I didn't really do anything. But then he's, he's pressed on it. And he says, well, uh, what I do is I shut down, essentially, I shut down my cold cognition. I shut down my mind. I shut down my perception. And as he puts it, I let my uh, spirit guide me. He says, I, I let my uh, spiritual desires guide me. And they guide me through the spaces and the ox in between the bones and the ligaments. I never touch anything. I'm just moving in the spaces in between. And it's pretty clear this is supposed to be a metaphor for our lives. We're supposed to live our lives like the cleaver going through the ox. So what's interesting about this is he's, talk, he's talking about, I think, essentially hot cognition as a force within him. So in the early Chinese worldview, this thing, the spirit, is implanted, in the Zhuangzi view at least, implanted in us by heaven, the supreme high god heaven. <clears throat> and it's something that can guide us. If we can, if we can loosen the hold of the mind upon us, it's something that can guide us. I think from a contemporary perspective, the best way to think about it is that he's shut down his cold cognition. And he's allowing his hot, his trained hot cognition, so not just what he's born with, but something he's trained up over a long period, to take over and do its work without the interference of the conscious mind. Another, uh, 
analogy or helpful way to think about this that I use with my students sometimes is the Star Wars example. So the end of the, la the first Star Wars movie, at least the first for us older people, um, uh, Luke Skywalker's got to blow up the Death Star. He's got to uh, fly down this trench and put his photon torpedoes in this very small opening. Um, and he turns on his targeting computer, and he hears in his head Obi-Wan's voice, right? He says, Luke. Use the force. <laughs> and he shuts off his targeting computer. And everyone back at Rebel Base is like, what are you doing? You turned off your targeting computer. He says, don't worry about it. And he, he taps into the force. He fires his torpedoes. They go into the little vent and blows up the Death Star. And he returns back to the Rebel Base triumphant. Very uh, romantic reunion with Princess Leia. It's romantic back then. It's kind of creepy now. <laughs> we didn't know about the whole brother-sister thing when, it, when I was little. Um, but it, what I like about this is it, um, it's the same basic idea, right? You're sh the targeting computers cold cognition, right? You're shutting down your conscious mind, your perception, and you're tapping into some deeper, bigger force that's going to guide you the right way. What's interesting, too, and very few people realize this, is there's a direct historical connection between Butcher Ding and Luke Skywalker. So uh, the Zhuangs of this text, the, the Zhuangs is an early Taoist text, pre-Buddhist Taoist text. It becomes the main influence in Chan Buddhism, an early form of Chinese Buddhism. Chan Buddhism goes to Japan, becomes Zen Buddhism. Zen's the Japanese pronunciation of the same character. Zen Buddhism becomes one of the, one of the two main components in the Bushido ideal, the ideal of the samurai. The ideal of the samurai becomes a huge influence on the films of Kurosawa. And George Lucas, in several interviews, has said that he was inspired by the samurai ideal when he was thinking about the Jedi Knights. So there's actually a direct, it's very torturous, but it's, there's a direct historical connection between that Butcher Ding story and, and uh, Luke Skywalker. You basically swap the cleaver out for a lightsaber. And it's, a, it's the same basic idea. You're, you're surrendering conscious control to this force within you that's more powerful than, than, the, than the small conscious self. Another helpful way to think about this, another uh, contemporary concept that's helpful is this idea of flow. So a lot of people have heard of uh, uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's idea of flow. And it shares a lot of the phenomenological or kind of from the inside feel uh, features of Wu Wei. So you lose a sense of yourself as an agent. You lose a sense of the passage of time. You are successful, and you don't, you don't feel like you're actually doing anything. For Csikszentmihalyi, though, for him, the crucial thing about flow is complexity and challenge. So he says he wants to distinguish flow from other states like zoning out in front of the TV, eating Doritos, where you lose a sense of passage of time, but it's not a, you, you emerge from that feeling dirty and bored and not energized. Um, what's special about flow, he thinks, is it's, you're in this flow channel, the perfect combination of your skill and the challenge of the situation. So if it's too challenging, you get anxious or uh, frustrated. If it's too easy, you get bored. So you've got to be in that perfect match between your skill and the situation. And that means that you've got to be constantly ramping up both of those things. So as you get better at the activity, you've got to ramp up the challenges, or you're going to, get, you're going to fall out of the flow channel into boredom. Um, so for him, it's about he talks about this ever-spiraling ever challenge and complexity. Now, this fits certain types of situations that we'd call flow or uwe, so high stakes um, rock climbing, competitive tennis. There's a lot of kayaking um, this fits as well. Um, the problem is it doesn't actually fit Chicksamihai's own survey data. So Chicksamihai's survey data, and he's now done decades of this, he and his colleagues have shown that most people report flow in situations like walking in a landscape that they've been in 100 times and they know really well on a level path. There's no ropes or chains involved. There's nothing challenging. They're just walking. But they feel like they're in flow. Another very common uh, place people report flow is social situations, hanging out with kids or hanging out with family members or friends over a meal. Again, very low challenge, very low complexity. So there's something, his definition of what we'd want to call flow or wu wei is, is missing something. And I think this is where wu wei is actually a more helpful concept. It's actually a bigger umbrella concept. So for the early Chinese, what defines wu wei, what sets it apart from other states, is being absorbed in something larger than yourself. So you're part of something that's bigger than yourself. Something else is kind of taking over in a way. And crucially, it's something that you value. 
So it's a bigger whole that, as philosophers would say, is normatively positive. You, you value it as something important. It doesn't have to be life-shaking. It could just be something that you care about doing well. But something bigger than you that you value is what induces wu That's how you get into the state. Now, for the early Chinese, this was a theological concept. And so for them, the larger whole was this metaphysical order to the universe. It was the Tao, so the way, the cosmic way. So you're in a state of Wu Wei when you can kind of get in touch with the Tao and let the Tao carry you along. For contemporary people who don't share the early Chinese worldview, it's, it's got to be other stuff. It can't be uh, this thing. It could be, though, theological. So for people who are traditionally religious, they often get into a, a flow way state in situations where they're worshiping with other people. So it could be a theological idea. I think more typically, again, we get into it in everyday situations where we're enjoying the people we're with, we're enjoying taking care of small children. We get into uwe or flow in landscapes that we value, that we love. There are certain landscapes like Point Reyes uh, that put me instantly into a state of uwe. Um, activities that we like, so uh, cooking, whatever your hobbies are that you care about, especially typically ones that you share with other people. There's a strong social component to uwe. So there's a variety of ways. And as modern people, we tend often these different larger holes are not connected in any kind of coherent way. There's no story you could tell that explains why you like cooking and point rays and kayaking. They, but they fit together in your mind in some way that's hard to articulate. And the key thing is that they all put you into this state. So that's the first of the concepts I want to introduce, this idea of wu wei. The second is this idea, it's unfortunately in modern Mandarin it's pronounced duh, which always makes my students giggle. Um, it's sometimes translated as virtue with a capital V, but I, I prefer something more like charismatic power. This is a power, it's a kind of aura that you kick off when you're in a state of wu wei. So if you're in wu wei, you emanate duh. And so this is the thing that, as a Confucian ruler, allows you to uh, cause people to follow you without coercion. You don't have to make them follow you. They just flock to you, and they want to obey you. If you're a Taoist, it's what allows you to move among people and even animals without being harmed. Everyone's kind of relaxed around you. So it's this very crucial power. It explains especially the social success of people who are in the state of Wu Wei. Now, again, for the early Chinese, the connection is explained in theological terms. So when you're in a state of Wu Wei, you're in harmony with heaven. Heaven likes you because you're doing what heaven wants. And so heaven gives you this power as a way, as kind of like a star on your forehead saying, this person's OK. Follow, do them, follow what they say or don't hurt them. Um, so it's, a, it's connected theologically. I think, again, we could tell a kind of modern, updated, naturalized version of this story where we see the connection between wu wei and da uh, in cognitive terms, in, in uh, cognitive scientific terms. Uh, but doing this is going to be a little bit more complicated than the, the Wu Wei story alone. And we have to go all the way back to the Pleistocene <laughs> to explain this. So we've spent, human beings have spent most of our evolutionary history in small hunter-gatherer bands. So in, in our, just like our primate ancestors. So bands where we kind of, we knew, we were related to or we knew most of the people we were interacting with. And then in an evolutionary blink of an eye, I mean, agriculture was super recent. If you have a long time view of, on the level of species, we start living in these large scale societies. So agricultural societies where we're, we're interacting with strangers all the time. We're having to coordinate with massive numbers of people way beyond what we ever had to do in our evolutionary history. And it's a very successful strategy. So 99.9% .9 of the people living today are living in large scale societies of one kind or another. So very successful strategy. There's a bit of a mystery of, about how we pull it off. Because going from a small scale village or hunter gatherer life to large scale societies involves various cooperation dilemmas that we're not equipped biologically to deal with. We haven't had time to evolve to deal with these things. So there's got to be some kind of two new mechanisms going on that help us get through some of these cooperation dilemmas. And there's a variety of them. The one that I want to focus on is one identified by the Cornell uh, economist Robert Frank. So he's talked a lot about this idea of uh, the emotions as having a kind of rational function in human cooperation dilemmas, and particularly in dilemmas that he, he talks about as commitment dilemmas. So these are situations where you have a cooperation situation that can only be solved by some kind of emotional commitment between people. The classic example is the prisoner's dilemma. 
And actually, right now at uh, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, they have an exhibit on social cognition, and that you can do the prisoner's dilemma. You can play it in various uh, iterations. So it's fun. I'd, I'd recommend seeing this display. The, the classic setup in the prisoner's dilemma: you have two prisoners who are being held separately. They've done something. They've done a crime. They, they're both they're guilty, and yet the DA doesn't have enough evidence. He doesn't have a very good case against them, and so. They, they are offered a deal. So one thing they could do is if they both just shut up, they'll get very little jail time. They'll, they'll both go to jail for a month because they don't have a very good case against them. But they're being offered a deal where if they, they rat on the other person, they get off scot-free. Then the other person has to go to jail for a full year. That's the deal that's being offered. Now, the problem in the prisoner's dilemma, they're being held separately. They can't communicate. Even if they could communicate, they'd have no way to enforce any kind of agreement they came to. The only rational decision in prisoner's dilemmas is to confess and betray, to defect, as economists say. And so what a purely rational being is going to get, so uh, they end up both confessing and betraying and get three months in jail, which is better than a year. That's why you have to do it if you're rational. But it's not great. It'd be better to just do one month in jail. Purely rational beings are always going to lose in the prisoner's dilemma. They're always going to get a suboptimal outcome in the prisoner's dilemma. What's interesting is that human beings, Vulcans can't solve the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, humans can. And the way humans do it, so we often solve prisoner's dilemmas. And there's multiple forms of this in, in everyday life um, through things like trust or honor. So why do uh, gang members not betray each other? Because they have honor. They're not going to betray their fellow gang member. Um, these are emotions. And the, the emotions are basically, this is Frank's argument. And I think he's right about this. The emotions are pre-binding us. They're forcing us into uh, honoring an agreement even when it becomes not rational to honor it, when it becomes uh, against our self-interest to honor it. One way to think of this, I think, that's helpful is the myth of Odysseus. So he knows that when he sails, he wants to hear the sirens, but he knows the future Odysseus is not going to be able to resist the sirens when he hears the siren call. So he has his sailors tie him to the mast and put wax in their ears so they don't hear the sirens. Um, he's bound himself. Uh, Odysseus 1, Odysseus in the present, is now making Odysseus 2, is forcing his decision in a way that Odysseus 2 has no choice over anymore. He's pre-binding himself. This is what emotions do for us. Emotions like honor and loyalty and love bind us to cooperation uh, dyads or triads or larger groups in a way that's relatively, that's immune to defection because we've now bound ourselves. So that's the power of commitments. So emotional commitments are crucial for human beings. These, these type of dilemmas arise all the time in human life there's a, there's a problem with these, though. There's, a, there's an issue with emotional commitments. And that's the, really the best strategy if, if you have commitment things going on, is to be able to fake commitments. It's to t have your sailors tie you to the mast, but it's not tied very tightly. You can get out of it if you want to. Um, that's, that would be ideal. So there's going to be pressure on people to cheat to fake commitments, because then they get all the benefits of the commitment interaction without paying any of the costs. And you're going to also express, uh, expect a kind of evolutionary arms race where people are going to get better at detecting people who are faking commitments. You're going to expect this, this to get ramped up. And so the worry in commitment uh, interactions is hypocrisy, so people faking the commitment to get the benefits. The solution, or at least partial solution, involves signaling of various kinds. And so this idea of signaling, one of the, the most helpful ways to think of it is in the non-human animal world, costly signaling. So this is an idea that developed when people were trying to explain things like gazelles. So when a gazelle is approached on the savanna by a predator, instead of running away right away, it stops. It just jumps up and down in place. It's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. You're just like, what's the matter with you? There's a lion. Run. <laughs> but they don't. And the argument, and it seems to be the case, is that it, this is a signal. The, the gazelle is saying, look how high I can jump. Don't try to chase me, because you won't catch me. And you'll waste time. I'll waste time. So why don't you go find a weaker gazelle who can't stop like I can, and I'm going to keep eating my grass and win-win situation. And this really seems to be what happens. Lions like, yeah, you're right. I can't catch you. And they go off and find another gazelle. Everyone wins. It only works, though, because it's inherently unfakeable. 
If you didn't have strong legs, you couldn't stop. You couldn't jump that high. So there are these kind of unfakeable signals in, in the animal world. In human beings, there's a kind of equivalent in these relatively unfakeable signals that we kick off in, in emotional displays and facial displays. Um, so the classic example is the, um, these must have been European researchers. So there, here's the pan-American smile, the superficial way American smile. Um, this is uh, a system two smile. You're, this is consciously willed. You're using your conscious uh, mind to make this smile. This is the so-called Duchenne smile. That's a sincere smile. That's hot cognition. It's different muscle systems in the face, and they're run by the different systems. One's run by system two, one's run by system one. So what we're looking for when we're evaluating someone who says that they're loyal, that's, who says that they honor the gang and they always want to be a member of our gang, we want to see this. We want to see something like the Duchenne smile. We want to see a facial expression that reflects a lack of cognitive effort. So we, we, we trust and we tend to uh, willingly engage in commitment situations with people who are not kicking off signs of cognitive control. So I think that's, that's the kind of signaling that human beings do with one another. And I think this explains the connection between trust and spontaneity, basically between wu wei and de, is that when we see people who, don't, who seem to be sincere, they don't seem to be making effort, we like them, we trust them, we want to follow them, we wish they would run for president, <laughs> right? This is, the, this is basically human beings using the mind ball paradox as a social signal. We're taking advantage of the fact that you can't force spontaneity to use it as a relatively honest signal. At least unless someone's a really good faker, we're going to use it as an honest signal. And this then explains the connection between wu wei and de in a naturalistic way. You don't have to tell the story about heaven giving to you as a power. It's that we trust people who are not kicking off signs of cognitive control. And there's a, I, there's a whole bunch of evidence, I look at some of it in the book, that people who are spontaneous behave properly. They cooperate better. And as soon as you give people time to think, then they start cheating. <laughs> they start getting more selfish. The default strategy for most people in large scale societies, at least, is to cooperate. So I think this is a, one way that Chinese philosophy can be very helpful. We have this connection between these ideas in early China that are explained theologically, but actually points in directions of new research. So there hasn't been a lot of work on this, the role of trust and commitment and spontaneity and human cooperations. It's now starting to get off the ground. But we need, this can be very helpful. There are new ideas that can help us understand things in our own world, like how a, a short-fingered Bulgarian could defeat a vastly more qualified and dignified opponent. He's got, he's got duh. It's evil, duh. You can have evil, duh. <laughs> this is where I think the Chinese are wrong. She completely lacks it. She, she, she's wooden. She lacks that kind of sense. People don't trust her because she's kicking off signs of cognitive control constantly. I think if you look at videos of the two of them, um, that's what it comes down to. People trust him um, because he's spontaneous. Even he's spontaneously evil, but <laughs> at least he's spontaneous. People like it. Um, so that's one way these ideas can be helpful. They, they explain things in our contemporary world that otherwise seem baffling. Another way uh, early Chinese thought can be helpful is they, they worried about this, something like the mind ball paradox a lot. They all wanted to get into a state of wu wei. So they developed these techniques for getting around the paradox that are actually quite sophisticated. So there, I walk through these in the book. There's the Confucius uh, carving and polishing strategy. So basically try really hard for a long time, and then the trying will fall away, and you'll be able to be spontaneous. There's the uh, Lao Tzian stop trying. Go back to nature. Be like the unhewn wood. Get back in touch with your real nature. That'll allow you to be spontaneous. There's the mention strategy that kind of splits the difference. We've got the beginnings of proper wu wei within us, but they're not strong enough. We need to cultivate them, help them along, but we can't force it too much. We've got to just be like a patient farmer uh, uh, cultivating sprouts. And then there's the Zhuangzi and forget about trying, forget about not trying, just let go and everything will be okay. The spirit will take over and you'll be fine. So you have these different strategies. None of them works. <laughs> in a 100% way, right? Because it's a real paradox. If, if one of these strategies worked, it wouldn't be a paradox. But each of them is a helpful way to try to get around the paradox. In the same way people have strategies like counting sheep or whatever when you're trying to get to sleep, you got to fake yourself out to get into a state of wu wei. What, which of these strategies is the most helpful probably depends on the situation, so the, the details of the barriers to spontaneity that you're facing. Life stage, 
So carving and polishing is, I think, clearly more important when you're younger. You just don't have the properly trained hot cognition yet to, to trust your hot cognition. Um, and probably personality type. So what's appropriate for an introvert may not be appropriate for an extrovert. There may be kind of innate differences in, in which, which strategy works the best for people. But I think there's something very helpful about having at your disposal a toolbox of different strategies that you can pick from depending upon the situation. So I think that's an important thing. Another important thing is just having these words, expanding our vocabulary. So I've found that people who know me or read my work start using wu wei all the time. You're not being very wu wei about this. Why don't you try to be a little more wu wei? <laughs> Come on, man. Um, she has no duh. I said this to people watching uh, tapes, you know, Hillary Clinton deliver speeches. Like, that woman has no duh. Um, you, we start, people start using these terms. And I think this ref, this, what this reflects is a, is a cognitive conceptual gap in the English language. So in the same way that we adopted the word schadenfreude from German because we feel schadenfreude, we just didn't have a word for it. I think these, these words, and words matter. Words help us focus on aspects of existence that we maybe don't pay enough attention to because we don't have a word for it. We don't necessarily identify it and single it out. So I think that's helpful. Another helpful thing is just the, the role of trust. So we tend to f uh, focus, I think, too much on contracts and explicit agreements and rules and miss the fact that most human interactions, whether in the workspace or in larger society, are about, about commitments. So it's, it focuses, looking at the spontaneity trust connection makes you think more about the fact that human interactions are about commitments and not contracts. It's about emotional ties people have. So that's another helpful thing. Um, just specific policy things, don't underestimate the power of alcohol. So this is going to be, this is going to be the next uh, book topic. But uh, you know, alcohol is a, is, a, is a very fast way to deactivate your system too, at least temporarily. Um, I, I think that in the workplace right now, you have a problem where you know, people are having dry holiday parties and discouraging people from going out drinking after work. And what they're worried about is that. Right? And that can happen at, at office parties. So they're, they're weighing the potential for this kind of disaster against what? People having fun. So it seems like the math is, is a no-brainer. You just don't do it. I think they're missing the point that the, when, you, when you don't give people this cultural tool, it's a cultural tool we've developed, you, you uh, make them less able to form commitment ties to one another. So there's something about human beings for millennia have been poisoning themselves, taking perfectly good foodstuffs and turning them into poison for some reason. And it's because it helps people get past cooperation dilemmas by temporarily down-regulating our defenses, our, our cognitive control. Um, so I think that when you know, we shake hands, when you shake hands with someone, you're basically saying, look, I don't have a weapon in my dominant hand, so I'm not trying to fool you or hurt you. Um, you do a couple shots with someone, you're basically taking your prefrontal cortex out and putting it on the table and saying, look, no cognitive control. Um, so what I say is really what I think. Uh, you can trust me. And this is a reason why you know, when, when Skype was invented, everyone's like, oh, well, people stop traveling for work, because why would you travel, fly to Shanghai if you can Skype with people there? People still fly to Shanghai. And that's because people don't trust other people unless they sit in a room with them and typically share a meal and, and typically get a little bit wasted with them. Because there's a sense that when you see someone in that kind of context, you get a and they're also, you're reading body signals, you're getting all this incredibly uh, thick bandwidth of, of information in person that you don't get over Skype or the phone. Um, so that's, uh, that's an important insight. And so the Chinese sometimes use drunkenness as a metaphor for Wu Wei. Uh, and there's something to that. It's, it's, a, it's a shortcut to down-regulating uh, your mind. And there is some evidence also of the, you know, there's this uh, idea that artists have long had about the muse that, you know, you, intoxication uh, causes creativity to happen. And there's some evidence for that. So uh, you get people mildly drunk in the lab, and they do better at creativity tasks. You can't get them too drunk, then they get bad again. <laughs> but there's a sweet spot where they're really good. Um, I presented on this uh, years ago, and the book came out at the Google campus in Irvine. And the first person who raised their hand was yeah. Balmer Peak. <laughs> so I looked into the Balmer Peak. Apparently, there's a very narrow blood alcohol concentration where you guys code a lot better. <laughs> That's the theory. Um, and afterwards, they took me to their wall of scotch. They have a room of scotch down there. I don't know if you guys are that cool, but they have an amazing room of scotch. Um, and I think what's interesting about that is you see, I think uh, places like Google have realized that if your, your business model is predicated on creativity and making breakthroughs and figuring stuff out, 
Um, making people just sit in front of the screen for a certain number of hours a day is not going to get you that. The, the striving, striving, striving doesn't work. And so these guys told me, they said, you know, we're facing a conceptual problem. We go to the scotch room and have a little bit of scotch, and then we play some ping pong, and then eventually we, we figure things out. You need to create space for creativity to happen. You can't force creativity directly uh, by make, chaining someone to a desk until they come up with an idea. Um, so that's important, uh, workplace design and kind of work culture. And at the most abstract level, embodied cognition. So if you take things like Wu Wei seriously, you take seriously the fact that we have embodied ways of being in the world that are very powerful and very important. Abstract knowledge alone is not enough. You can have abstract knowledge and not be good at things. You need to train imagination. So when you educate kids, you need to train them how to problem solve and how to think, not just a, a set of facts about the world. Um, and I think this is something we're terrible at right now, is you've got to create space for your unconscious to do its work, for your body to do its work. So right now, we bombard ourselves with constant information. We never have time to actually integrate the information that we already have. So you need to create space for a way to happen. You have to go walk for walks in the mountains. Um, you have to let your mind wander a little bit. Um, you could do this through physical activity, so things that distract your mind uh, from itself because you're doing something with your body. Um, and also, I think crucially, you got to sleep. <laughs> so the people who are striving oriented tend to view sleep as just this horrible waste of time. How can we minimize that wasted time? It's not wasted time. Uh, when you're sleeping, you're doing important work. You're pruning neural connections. You're integrating the knowledge you acquired during the day. It's a very good example of something that looks like you're doing nothing, but you're doing a lot. Um, and people who don't get enough sleep just don't have a good enough integration of the knowledge they've been acquiring during the day. So we need to build more space into our lives in a way we don't have enough, I think. So um, when the book came out, it was originally marketed as a self-help book, which I advised against. And ex what happened is exactly what I predicted. People who bought it as a self-help book were pissed off because they thought there'd be 10 steps to being a Zen master, and they could just follow the 10 steps, it'd be fine. Um, the fortune cookie's empty. There's no, the early Chinese don't have any kind of magic formula for how to attain Wu Wei. Um, so it's not helpful directly in that kind of self-helpy way. Where it is, I think, helpful is by focusing our attention on the importance of embodied cognition, uh, the imagination, the importance of trusting our body in certain situations, and crucially also getting us to see how this, this spontaneity is linked to trust and how spontaneity is really at the center of human success in a, in a lot of areas of our lives. So thank you. So uh, in this era of uh, uh, quantified segmented cells where every moment, every breath has to be justified and yeah. time cards and uh, you know, we are, we are quantifying ourselves in so many ways, number of steps, number of breaths, number of heartbeats, yeah. all of that. Um, it really seems completely counter to this idea of flow and trust and unquantified cells where creativity can bloom. Mm -hmm. um, so, in fact, it sounds like we are poisoning ourselves with all this quantification. What do you think? Yeah, no, I totally agree. This is one of the problems is that we don't, we don't build in enough time for these things. Um, and you know, technology has made it worse. So when I was a student, you always had, like, you had enforced downtime. At the very least, when you're walking from one class to another, there's nothing else you can do except look at the squirrels running around the trees and let your mind wander. Now I look at my students, and they're constantly plugged in somehow or answering texts. They never actually are not taking in information. And I think that's really troubling. I think it's going to, and it's going to have uh, effects down the line in terms of people's ability to really have creative breakthroughs. Um, so I think smart companies actually are aware that you need to give people some unstructured time um, and create ways for them to interact in, in ways that aren't being quantified. That, you know, what are we doing? What did we accomplish in this meeting? It's not clear. <laughs> but we drank some good scotch and we played some good foosball. And, um, and maybe like next week, we're going to have some benefit from that. But it's hard to predict. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. And uh, I'm Chinese. I'm so proud of you bringing so many Ch Chinese culture <laughs> to your book. <laughs> and uh, I just finished the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Yeah. And uh, it, did, it does say that we, when we do a lot of things, we should use our system too, right? Yeah. But here you talk about the Wu Wei. That seems a 
conflict ideas, and uh, especially when we do the investment, right? Mm -hmm. We should be reasonable. And yeah. uh, so, do you, do you think that we can be contributors some to the investment? Yeah. Oh, to the investment? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's that's an important point. So Kahneman's book, which I flashed briefly up there, Thinking Fast and Slow, the work that he's done on two-system thought is how system one's dangerous. <laughs> and you need to guard against system one and actually use system two. And the situations, and he's right about that, we're subject to all these kind of uh, errors of thinking when we're trusting our system one. And that really has to do with a mismatch between our evolved cognition and the structure of modern life. We're just not built to reason about investment. We're not built to reason about climate change, right? Climate change is such a big thing. We just don't deal with causality well intuitively on that level. And that's where we either have to use system two. And so, I mean, system two, so I've been emphasizing the power of system one partly as a corrective. Obviously, system two is crucial. There's a reason we evolved that it's super expensive physiologically, so we wouldn't have it if it was really important. Um, so in situations like climate change, um, investment, you either need to switch into system two to do it right, and he's, you know, Kahneman's focused most on, on that, on correcting your intuitions, um, or you need to figure out a way to make your system one do the things that system two wants it to do. And so that's where I think things like, you know, Al Gore, um, doesn't just give you the stats. He shows you a polar bear drowning in the Arctic because there's no more ice. Um, you gotta make the, the you can take system two insights and build them into your system one. And that's actually, so the Confucian self-cultivation strategy is interesting because the model seems to be, they have these insights using cold cognition. It's not what they're born with. Um, they, so for instance, Shunzi, this uh, late warring states Confucian, He's got this passage where he talks about where did ritual, and by this he really means all of Confucian culture, where did it come from? And he says, the sage king saw the state of nature, people were fighting with each other, it was chaotic, and they hated it. And so they seem to then switch into system two cognition and say, what would be the best way to distribute resources in a society? And so they're using cold cognition and what seems to be utilitarian reasoning. But Western philosophers would then stop there. And then they would say, well, let's teach everyone how to reason using utilitarianism. But they don't. They say, OK, now let's design rituals and music and things that will take that cold insight and build it into people's hot cognition so they can really actually do it reliably. Um, so that's the other. So to get around the limitations of our system one is either to switch purely into system two, which probably is, is appropriate in some situations, or to use system two insights to transform. Because system one is fungible. You can change it. That's how skill acquisition happens, right? Um, so you can reshape your, your emotions and your virtues in ways that I think the Confucians had some really powerful cultural technologies uh, for doing. So, those, so that's an important point. Kahneman focuses more on how our system one is prone to errors. Um, I, that's why I tend to, in, in a corrective way, try to emphasize how system one is really important. Um, I like the... The concepts are the at least the words that uh, you you put up way and there is that uh, I call it I used to call it like emotional or rational something like uh, much okay. more vague um, and actually my question was a little bit uh, um, that uh, if you go full emotional full way is like um, and you lose all rationality mm -hmm. um, that's not ideal you become more like a, a pure instinct more animal esque. And, uh, but on the other side, full um, rational system too, in this context, um, is just too dry. I mean, it's like, um, it's not a healthy way to live and, and eventually mm -hmm. it grinds out way too much. Uh, so everyone, I guess, has to find like their, their middle in between, like uh, where to use uh, system two, where to use system one. And the idea is to flow as much as possible, but you're right that we have to be able to uh, to actually detect one system when the intuition is just wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, also, it's also important to realize that, that system one is not fixed. Mm -hmm. System one can get oh, yeah. reshaped in a variety of ways. So we're not just stuck with the system one that we had when we were four year olds. But I think one of the knowledge. problems is that uh, when we consciously try to change our system one yeah. in ways that are, are actually not natural to us, mm -hmm. you know, when we try, when we try to 
like outforce yourself. And I don't know, it's just, uh, it's just a, a comment. I don't really have a question about yeah, it. Yeah, you, you need to work. So that's where the mention, I like the mention model a lot because he's saying we got to change our system one. We, need, we just have these sprouts. We need to make them grow into full grown virtues. But you can't force it. You can't, he has a story about a farmer who goes out and pulls in his sprouts to try to make them grow faster mm. and kills them. So you can't be like the Moist utilitarians who want to pull on their sprouts. But you also can't be lazy and sit around and not water or weed at all. You gotta do something. So the important thing to realize is that none of, none of the early Chinese thinkers really think we're okay at birth. Even the most radical, so people like Lao Tzu who says let's go back to our original nature, um, he, he's writing this. So the people he's talking to are already messed up. <laughs> so they need to go back to something that is, that's a kind of manufactured nature that um, you know, he's imagining is what our true nature is. So I think all of these things, no one thinks that we want to have the hot cognition we had when we were four-year-olds. Um, toddlers are not a model of how we want to behave. So the, the trick then is how much shaping is appropriate and how much cold cognition is appropriate. And that's where the splits between, for instance, the Taoists and Confucians arise. The, con the Taoists think the Confucians are overdoing it and turning us into robots. And the Confucians think that the Taoists are kind of lazy um, children who <laughs> don't, don't understand civilized life. And, and the two play off each other. I mean, I don't think uh, the Tao Te Ching or the Zhuangzi make sense except as kind of protest movements against this kind of excessive training, what they see as excessive training. So there's a balance you need to strike. And the fact that none of these schools ever really wins out in early China suggests that there's no right answer. Uh, there's no right way to get that balance. So you mentioned ways in which technology makes the problem worse. Yeah. Uh, do you see any ways in which technology helps or can help? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to self-driving cars. <laughs> I'm looking forward to a, a time when you could actually use commute time instead of being, again, drowned by too much information and people merging and worrying about traffic, um, to having to create opening up new spaces for daydreaming and just looking out the window and thinking about things. So there could be ways um, that technology can help. Um, technology can also help just by making us more efficient when we are exerting effort so that we create more time to be off. The problem is that's not actually what happens, right? <laughs> We're more efficient and we just keep doing that, right? So um, if it was, you know, back in, when I was in grad school, you still had to write letters to people, you know? So if I wanted to correspond with a European colleague, you'd write a letter and on that funny thin paper and you'd mail it and you have to wait, you know, a month or two and come back. Um, now I can email them, so that's more efficient. But all it means is that I now interact with a lot more people and I have a lot more work to do. So that's the problem, is that technology, I think, in theory could help. But it just seems to be human nature that we, we overdo things and we tend to just not know when to stop. Um, but I think that that's something that needs to be thought about, is how to use technology not just to increase our efficiency at work, but to use that then to buy us time to, to have that downtime, to allow our embodied cognition to do its thing. So I can personally re relate to the idea of uh, not trying too hard to be good at something. And uh, thanks for sharing that. The one thing I thought you didn't talk about at all was practice. Mm -hmm. I cannot be good at anything just by not trying too hard at it. I yeah. have to practice for it deliberately before I stop thinking about it and then I'm going to be good. Yep. So that's uh, the, that was kind of my point with the life stage thing. Um, you can't sit down. So if I sat down at a piano, I don't know how to play the piano. If I sat down and tried to solo, or I would sound ridiculous. It would sound stupid. I have a brother-in-law in Rome who's a jazz pianist um, who does that. He'll sit down at a piano and just noodle around. It sounds amazing. He has, an al he has a, a song called I'll Be Bach, where he takes Bach and then does weird things to it. He starts playing it faster, slower. He starts adding stuff, puts things in the piano. Um, it sounds cool, but only because he knows how to play Bach, because he's trained his whole life to be a musician. So in the, in the Butcher Ding story, he also talks about how, I've, well, why can I do this? I trained for 19 years as a butcher, and that's why I'm able to do that. So that's what I mean. None of this stuff, it's always against the background of training. And obviously, in the earlier stages, the carving and polishing is more important. You can't solo until you learn how to master the thing. Um, th I think that that's where like the corrective Taoist strategies of forgetting or letting go, they're really more appropriate once you're a trained expert 
And now what you need to do is stop thinking. And so there's actually, I run through some of the experimental evidence that uh, uh, people who are good golfers need to uh, not think. So if you ask them to think about what they're doing when they're putting, they overshoot the hole. If they're a baseball player and you have them think about what angle are you hitting the ball, think about the angle you're using when you hit the ball, they don't hit as well, professionals. But novices do better when they think. So they need to pay attention. And so obviously, which one, whether you're focusing on trying or not trying, depends on where you are in that skill development training um, per, uh, course, of, course of knowledge acquisition. So you're absolutely right. I didn't emphasize the training thing so much, but all of this is against the background of the fact that none of the hot cognition that we, we value, very little of it, is inborn. It needs to be acquired. It needs to be trained. But once you have the training, you need to know when to let your training go. Thanks. Right.